Thanks for joining me on another series here of painting a portrait of John Bunyan. This is the next step here, part two. Uh, we did part one where I filled in the um, notan or chiaroscuro in the background, uh, just quickly blocking in the major distinctions and value. And now I'm adding some more detail, um, going into the uh, area on the books, adding some grayish tones there. And then after that, we'll be diving into some other details. But the first part is just to get a glaze that works for the text of the book. And then I'm going to put in some detail here um, just to the right of his cuff and a little more detail as well on the sleeve. So even though I modeled for this, um, I want to make sure that I overall have the uh, right form and I'm making this look like 17th century clothing. And I want to get a few little wrinkles in using a really small brush and just uh, I believe a size zero round brush and keeping the paint very fluid. So I mix matte medium with it, um, spray a little mist of water on the palette to keep the paint um, so it flows off the brush very freely, keeps it from drying and getting all coagulated and lumpy. And I'm putting a little bit of detail around his sleeve. There's little certain wrinkles that go in just the right places to show that his arm is bent. And I'm trying to portray that right now. I'm adding a little more form to those wrinkles. And I'm getting a really chiseled edge on the brush. Just turning it to a point and then meeting those two lines together so that the crease in the middle really stands out. I'm going to be going across, meeting some of these wrinkles with the edge of the shadowed area. And that way the edge of the actual arm gets somewhat ambiguous, gets a little lost in the detail. And that's important to get that ambiguity there as well. I'm adding a few wrinkles going across from the armpit area. And I don't want this to look overly patterned. That's a common mistake that beginning artists make is they do make wrinkles in clothing very much evenly spaced and the same thickness and direction. But what you want to do is space them apart um, at different intervals. And now I'm adding some of the uh, detail on the prison bars because John Bunyan was in prison for preaching the gospel without a license. And while he was in prison for, I believe, 12 years, that's where he penned Pilgrim's Progress, one of the most famous books in the world, um, second only to the Bible as far as sales, maybe of all time, but for sure of Christian books. And what I'm doing is adding some uh, romber dark titanium white, a little bit of ultramarine blue, but mostly raw umber dark and titanium white. And just adding that on my sketch, uh, wherever I had those lines indicated for the prison bars, just going over with that same round brush, keeping the paint very fluid. And you can see how I'm kind of going back and forth. It looks like I have a little bug on my canvas there. Well, I suppose in prison, he must have had all kinds of little creatures in there, worms and bu bugs and the kinds of things you wouldn't want to run into. Um, I just uh, used my finger there to wipe off a little bit that went over the edge. It's not a big deal. Now I'm going back in to refine some of the edges with titanium white um, on his sleeve area because um, I went a little too far in with the, uh, the shading with the no tan. So I just want to make sure I have that form refined. So you can push and pull. You can go back and forth. If you went too far in with some of your um, dark values in your initial block in, it's always possible then to cut back in with white and remedy anything that's off. Now this is a little bolder than my usual glazing technique. Normally I'd add a lot more layers but uh, I was on a tight deadline with this commission portrait, so I had to make it happen really fast. This whole entire portrait, um, again, a book cover illustration for Pilgrim's Progress. It was uh, done on an 8x10 canvas board, and it took me just a, just a few hours to do. I did it basically in one night. Uh, started it at about 8 o'clock at night, 
and finished it at around 2, 2.33 in the morning. So um, had to get it done quickly and so sometimes necessity is the mother of invention and you have to go a little bit more opaque, a little bit bolder if you're on a tight deadline. Now I'm adding some details within the facial area. Um, just thickening his nose bridge a little. I noticed in the reference photo that the nose has a little more thickness. You know, since the face is turned at a three-quarter angle, it, it is going to be a little bit uh, wider on that area. So I added a little bit more shading to that so that his nose doesn't look too flat. Now I did, of course, change his likeness. It's not supposed to look like me. I have kind of a big bushy beard, whereas he had a mustache and a little slow patch. So I just want to change that. Now I'm going in with a glaze to begin to get the coloring for his suit, his, his clothing. So that's the beauty of the glazing technique. Even if you begin with some somewhat more opaque methods, you can definitely employ the glazing technique where you need it. And you notice that as I apply this glaze, um, burnt sienna, raw or dark, I think a little bit of alizarin crimson and raw sienna, as I apply it, I lost none of my detail work. It all remains. And so basically I'm just staining the color in and also um, getting the va values incrementally a little darker on his clothing. Because we want to not only look for the coloring, we want to look for the value. And as I've said many, many times, value is so much more important than color. Now I'm going to continue um, just refining the edge of his clothing just a little bit and adding a shadow here to the white lapel. So th for that I mixed um, a little more ultramarine blue and titanium white to cool that color down. And you have to be aware of the shadows, how they're going to take on a different color. White is going to tend to have more of a grayish color, um, obviously, and it's going to be a little lighter in value than the shadows of the other parts of the clothing. And those parts of the shadows just meld right into the background, but the white part of his clothing is going to be a little bit more of a gray. Now I'm putting a glaze on top of the table and that's a mixture of raw sienna and maybe a little bit of uh, raw umber dark and just want to differentiate uh, between the values of the table and then the white pages of the books that he has on his table. Now I'm adding a little bit of detail work to his knuckles and just kind of filling in some of the shading there, which uh, is very important. I want to continue that shadow that I painted onto his lapel that needs to continue all the way across and that needs to cut up along his shoulder. And you notice I'm using a different color. It has a little more brown, a little warmer, and it's a little darker in value as well than the lapel. So that gives us a great sense of realism. Those cast shadows are amazing for really creating a sense of three-dimensionality. Don't underestimate the power of a cast shadow. You want to have a combination of very smooth shadows where the uh, gradation is very gradual. The transition from dark to light or light to dark is incremental and slow. And you want to balance that with these very harsh shadows where the edges are distinct. And that typically occurs um, whenever you have a plane or an object that has a a hard break in direction. Um, typically you won't find that so much on faces. You might find that on angular parts of a face like a nose. Um, but those cast shadows, that's where you're really going to see those harsh edges. And that's shadows typically from a person's chin being cast onto the rest of their shoulder. Or if their arm is extended out, you'll see that shadow cast maybe on a different part of their body. Now I'm adding a glaze to the background. I had that initial glaze that I put down um, of raw or dark titanium white, raw sienna, and maybe a bit of ultramarine blue. And now I'm doing kind of the same color again, the same glaze again. And again, this is um, acrylic paint mixed with clear matte medium. Clear matte medium. Liquitex makes a great version of matte medium or Nova color. But again, I'm just uh, applying this 
semi-opaque. It's a very thick glaze. Usually I make my glazes much more translucent and I apply many more layers. But again, the tight deadline, the tight deadline forced my hand to go a little bolder, a little more opaque. So basically just trying to get the background in a few layers. And you can see how I'm filling that in and adding a lot more richness. So even if you went opaquely, you still want to have a couple layers um, just so you can get that richness and depth. I'm cutting up along the edge of the window and then bring that down into the table area, smoothing it out using a very, very light brush stroke at the end to smooth it out after I get it on there. You apply it firmly at first and then use a very light amount of pressure to smooth it out at the end. And that's the way to get a really smooth layer uh, with the glazing technique. Also vary your brush strokes. You can see how I'm radiating them out in all different directions. That helps too to get a lot of smoothness and depth. Now I want to fill that area below the table. That should be in shadow. I get a lot of paint on my brush, a really copious amount. I just scoop it up off of my palette so I can really apply it quickly. And that is one of the secrets to getting a smooth ap application. It is hard on your brushes, but brushes are pretty inexpensive if you buy the right ones. Hobby Lobby sells a good pack of brushes for $12.99, all different sizes in one pack. They're high quality brushes. Um, but you can really spread this out smoothly if you put a huge amount on the tip of your brush and then just apply it quickly and wipe off any excess. Now I'm glazing right over the edge of the table and really glazing in just that edge there. And just trying to smooth that out. So I'm going over very, very smoothly. Um, just with a few wispy strokes at the end. And we want to put that part of the table in shadow because the light is not hitting it, but it did need to be somewhat lighter than the background as well. And that's pretty much how I'm um, finishing up here. So thank you so much for watching this video. Um, if you like it, subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. And Please share this video with your friends. Let them know about Realistic Acrylic Portrait School, where you can find more tutorials to help you with your portrait painting. And that is my goal, to help you become a portrait painter where you can paint a portrait you're proud of. So again, thanks so much for watching. God bless, and we'll talk to you soon.